Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Don Kilburn. I'm the uh, president of Pearson North America. Uh, Pearson is a global education company helping learners around the world advance their lives. Uh, today's session is with the United States Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. I just want to tell a little personal story. Um, when I was coming here, I told my 14-year-old, I said, I'm going on another trip. He said, well, Dad, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to the Aspen Ideas Festival. He said, why? I said, well, I talked to some people. He says, can you tell me what you're going to do with this? I said, well, I'm introducing the secretary, Arnie Duncan. And he says, you're introducing Arnie Duncan? This is my 14-year-old. I said, I am. He said, Dad, can you get his autograph? I'm like, why? He said, did you know he was the MVP of the NBA Celebrity All-Star Game? <laughs> Well, not only is he a hero in my son's eyes, um, he may be one of the most influential secretaries since the department was started in 1979. Uh, his work on higher education in terms of more accountability and transparency, especially around student loans, placement, graduation rates, has been remarkable. Um, he's also recently, and I think, think th through his term, has embraced outputs over inputs. Um, and I can tell you from a Pearson perspective where last year we uh, seriously embraced an efficacy framework where every single product and engagement we have is going to have a measurable outcome, uh, we, we welcome this initiative. Uh, Secretary Duncan has devoted his entire life to learners. Um, we are fortunate to have him here today. Uh, let me turn it over to David Leonhardt and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming, Mr. Secretary. It's great to have you here. Um, uh, so we are, as you could see from the title, we're going to focus on higher education. But um, it's not exactly an original thought that kids, uh, in order to get to higher education, have to first do lower education. So we're going to start with just a few minutes on K through 12 um, to inform the larger discussion of higher ed. And then um, we're going to leave a bunch of time to open it up to, to have some conversation with you all, which I know the Secretary really wants to do. Um, so let's, you've been there since the very beginning. You joined the administration um, from having run the Chicago schools. Um, just walk us through in very simple terms what, when you came in, what did you see as what was working with K through 12 education and what was not working with K through 12 education? And if I can, just start one step before that on the early childhood side, because Great. I think that's the foundation. Um, we have made significant progress on, on the early childhood side. We've invested over a billion dollars, where historically we did very little. But Dave, at the end of the day, as a nation, we have so far to go. And we are not close to providing the access for our zero to five year olds to high quality early learning opportunities that they need. And one of the toughest things in my job is meeting with education ministers from other countries, and they keep asking how come the United States doesn't care about its babies. That's a hard question to try and answer. And I keep saying we have to get out of the catch up business. The average child coming from a disadvantaged community starts kindergarten, five years old, a year to 16 months behind, and we don't do a great job of playing catch up. So we've had some progress there, but a long, long way to go. Um, in the real world, we've made this a bipartisan issue. We've had 30 governors invest, more Republican than Democrat, that's fantastic, but we have not broken through the dysfunction in Congress to put the kind of massive investment. So, I have to start there because I think that's, as a nation, that's the best investment we can make. Which states, I know a little bit about Oklahoma and Georgia, which states do you think are doing the most exciting things on pre-K? Um, those would be up there. Um, you have places, not even doing the most exciting, places like Mississippi that never did anything before now investing. Alabama, places you wouldn't sort of think about. Um, uh, Governor Dayton, Minnesota is making huge progress there. Uh, so you're seeing, again, across the political spectrum, Profiles encourage in tough economic times people investing, and we just want to see more of that. The challenge is we have state after state 10,000, 12,000 kids on waiting lists who we're not getting to. Uh, jumping to, to your real question, K to 12. So one of the biggest things that I've struggled with is just the dropout rate. And we, everyone here knows if you drop out of high school, you're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. There are no good jobs out there. So the good news is high school graduation rates are now at all-time highs at 80%. We're thrilled with that progress. Um, we had about 2,200 high schools that were quote unquote dropout factories where a disproportionate number of kids are dropping out. We've got that down to about 1,500, so we've got about a third of the way there, long way to go. Um, but high school graduation rates up, dropout rates down very significantly over the past decade. Latino dropout rates have been cut in half from 28% to 14%, black almost in half. So that progress is great, but having said that, 
that 20% who aren't graduating, that equates to not quite, but close to a million young people leaving our schools for our streets each year? Every year. Every year, every year. And uh, every state I go to, this is a very rudimentary measure, but I just ask how many ninth graders in your state and how many 12th graders? And I keep looking for the state that's stealing all the 10th, 11th, 12th graders. I haven't found them yet. So we have to work on that. And then the other side, which gets into the, the college side, is of our high school graduates, far too few are actually prepared for college level work. So they're graduating but taking remedial classes. And that's why raising standards is so hugely important. So real progress in states adopting higher standards, uh, real breakthrough there. Um, the hard work is implementing those higher standards, helping teachers and students and parents understand those, and making sure young people aren't just graduating, but graduating prepared either for college or for career. Two specific things on K through 12. Common core, obviously. Uh, there's been a little backlash to it. Um, uh, can you just, I, I think a lot of people hear the phrase and may not even be able to offer a two-sentence description of it. Yeah. So would you give us your one, two, three-sentence description of it? Yeah. And would you tell us how concerned you are about the political backlash, mostly from the right, but a little bit from the left? No, but on both sides. On both, both sides. sides. But on the extremes of both sides. So let me back up. You sort of asked, what did we inherit? And so the No Child Left Behind law had some strengths, had some significant weaknesses, but one of the absolutely unintended effects of No Child Left Behind was that it encouraged states to dummy down standards to look good. So in fact, we had about 20 states reduce standards to make politicians on both, both sides of the aisle appear that children were being successful. And many examples, one of the toughest is Tennessee. Tennessee has some of the lowest standards, and my numbers won't be exact, but in Tennessee, before they raised standards, they were saying something like 91% of kids in fourth grade math were proficient. When they raised standards, it went to like 28%. And achievement gaps that were large doubled. But guess what? Tennessee, for the first time in decades, was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. We had an honest baseline. And guess what? Subsequent to that, Tennessee is the fastest improving state in the nation, Tennessee along with DC. So what we inherited was a situation with very perverse incentives. So raising standards, high college and career ready standards, Historically, our nation, 50 different states, 50 different standards, 50 different goalposts, many got dummied down. For me, my theory of change is the opposite. Have a high bar, the, uh, tight on goals, but be loose on means. Give people a lot more flexibility to get there. So we've had the vast majority of states, 44, 45, adopt higher standards. Um, we've had some pushback on both sides. We're still at 42, 43 right there. And to be clear, because people get confused, standards are just what you should know. <laughs> in fourth grade, in eighth grade, in eleventh grade, in twelfth grade. If you're having trouble sleeping one night, please go online and look at what these standards are. Um, how you teach to those standards, the curriculum, will never be determined by us, by anyone. These standards were voluntarily adopted. Inner city urban, rural, suburban, whatever it might be remote. How you teach to kids should never be determined you know, at the federal or state level. That should be determined in local communities. But having a common high bar, because our children aren't competing for jobs in their neighborhood, or in their district in the state, they're competing with children in China, in Singapore, in India, and in South Korea. We want them prepared for that. So having high standards is a really important piece of the puzzle. None of these things solve the problem by themselves. Behind that, we have two consortia of states working on the next generation of assessments to have common, measure common measurements for hitting those higher standards. And you're also having states, uh, this sounds revolutionary, and sadly it is, we have states for the first time in teacher evaluation starting to have student learning being a piece of teacher evaluation. One of the things we inherited when we came in, I learned something new every day, there were about five states that had laws on the books. It was prohibited by law to link student achievement with teacher evaluation. So what was in teacher evaluation? Peer evaluation? Principal uh, evaluation? Not much. Not much. Not much. And for me, it demeans the teaching profession. It didn't recognize great talent and the amazing work that extraordinary teachers do every day to transform lives. It didn't help those teachers in the middle who needed more support and teachers at the very bottom where it simply wasn't working. It didn't help them find something else to do. So all these things, higher standards, next generation assessments, meaningful teacher and principal evaluation, it is a huge amount of change in a short amount of time. It is scary to both the far left and the far right. Um, but David, I just feel this huge sense of urgency. Our kids can't wait and we don't have 40 years, 50 years to figure this out. And kids today, if they get an education, have a world of opportunity out there. If they don't get an education, they're just no good options. And so you think the, the sturm und drang around Common Core is bigger than the number of states that are actually gonna pull back from it? Um, yes, there's pushback, and this is broad, you know, broad brush strokes. 
but um, many on the far right don't like the idea of common and doing things together, you know, something national. And again, to be clear, this is not something we impose. This was adopted, created by governors, by state school chief officers, adopted at the local level. We did put some incentives out there for high standards, um, but you have that pushback from the far right. And um, on the, the far left, with some unions, not all unions by any measure, but some pushback on the accountability side of this, of tying teacher evaluation to whether students are actually learning or not. Let's pivot, let's make testing our pivot because it covers both K through 12 and college. So um, uh, on a personal note, my, my wife and I don't have that many political disagreements, but standardized tests are one of our few. The good news for you is that I'm doing this panel. The bad news for you is that I asked her to write a question for you. So, we'll take it, we'll take it. So, my wife so, and I have very similar conversations. So, so here's the question. We now have kids in elementary school, in middle school and junior high school, often devoting weeks of time to tests. Maybe it's a week for a test, maybe it's close to two. They spend weeks preparing for them. That is a lot of time that they could be learning English, yeah. on the playground, learning music. Yeah. Um, given the amount of time we're having little kids spending taking tests, how confident are you that the results are actually meaningful for what they're learning and what teachers are teaching? Well, let me back up. Where there's too much time on testing itself, and for me even more is too much time on teaching to the test, test prep, that's a real problem. So I just want to put that out there. I've said that publicly many, many times. As we go into the new school year, we're going to be coming out not with policy, but with guidance where too much is too much. So let me just be clear. There are two extremes on this. Where people are over-testing, and to be clear, what we ask at the federal level is third through eighth grade math and reading, and once, a, once in high school. But then what often happens, states layer on, districts layer on, schools layer on, and kids don't care where it's coming from, teachers don't care, it's just too much. And do you write the, the, the feds write the third and the eighth grade tests? Absolutely not. No. There is no federal, well, never, never has been, never will be. Thank you for clarifying that. So this is all adopted, again, run at the state, state and local level. So where there is too much testing and too much time on test prep, we need to fight that. Um, when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, when I took over, we were taking the state test and we were taking the Iowa test of basic skills. Given we were in Chicago, I wasn't sure why we were taking the Iowa test and we eliminated it. So we cut out about half the testing. We worked very hard to get teachers to spend less time prepping kids how to fill in bubbles and how to teach them. Great teaching leads to good results on that. So where there's too much time in that, we should challenge that, and we are challenging states and districts and coming out with some pretty interesting data of where people are doing too much. The flip side of that is folks, who, go ahead. Sorry. How do you get, when, when you think folks are doing too much, how do you as the Secretary of Education, what levers do you have to get them to do less? Uh, it's a really good question. I, I think no one, I don't think a lot of people want to do too much. They just don't realize how this is sort of built up over time. And again, you know, they have to do things for, the, for us at the federal level. The state does stuff, local, district. And I think there just hasn't been enough awareness amongst administrators that, at the end of the, you know, we're taking four or five different tests and, you know, doing all this. So I don't think it's actual, no one's asking for more testing. I think it's just education is often slow to change and adjust. And I'll give you an example. You know, one of the places we've found where we think there's probably too much testing going on is the Cleveland Public Schools. And Cleveland has a great superintendent, a great head of the union. They weren't aware. And they're starting to really look at what they're doing and unpeel that onion a little bit, peel that onion. And may see some, that's one example. There are others. Um, so I don't know if there's so much resistance. We don't have huge levers other than transparency and talking about this and having honest conversations. And, you know, we all come with this as parents. My kids, you know, you want them being evaluated, but you don't want too much. Again, just going to the other extreme, there are lots of folks who would like to walk away from any accountability. And I will, I, I will fight that just as hard as I fight the over-testing. I think it's a common sense middle ground. I basically want to know how much students are learning each year, how much they are growing. I'm much less interested in absolute test scores. If students are taking third grade math and they're, they're having two years of growth for a year's instruction, that is an amazing teacher that we need to learn from and empower and replicate and have her be a mentor, master teacher, where you have kids who are getting a month of learning, a month of growth for a year's instruction. They are falling desperately behind. In a couple years of that, they'll never recover. So how much are we getting better? And can we learn from those teachers that are doing this at the top and, again, support those in the middle and those who are simply not working? challenge that status quo as well. And you think the tests we have, I'm sure they're imperfect because everything is, but you think they are giving us a lot of real information. They're giving us some information. I am dissatisfied with the current set of tests that folks are using. So we invested $350 million through Race to the Top 
in two consortia of states to help create the next generation of assessments. The two consortia are named Park and Smarter Balance. They field tested in states across the nation this year. They'll go live in many places in the fall. These will be also imperfect, but they'll be a significant step in the right direction, moving way beyond film and uh, bubble tests, looking at critical thinking skills, looking at how you solve complex problems, much more real world application. And so this is going absolutely in the right direction. Okay. So one of the things I think we often hear is we have this K through 12, pre-K through 12 crisis, right? We've had it for decades. Um, and then people say, but we have the best colleges in the world. Kevin Carey, who I'm sure you know, who is at the New America Foundation, just wrote a piece for us at the Times in which he said, that's all wrong. <laughs> when we say that we have the best colleges in the world, we're talking about Berkeley's PhD programs. We're talking about Harvard. We're not actually talking about the average college. And when you look at the average college, it looks a lot like the average high school or middle school or elementary school. When you look at these international tests, when you look at dropout rates, we don't have the best colleges in the world. And, and, and now I'll leave Kevin's and go to me. Not only do we not have the best colleges in the world, it seems to me, boy, have we not done very much to hold them accountable. We hand the money and say enroll kids. Um, is that too harsh a diagnosis? No. Uh, yes to Kevin and yes to your thesis. And I was trying to be very self-critical. I think we at the federal level, so we can talk about states' role in this and we should talk about universities' role in this, and we, we'll get into that. But we at the federal level, I think, have been part of the problem. And we put out $150 billion with a B, $150 billion in grants and loans each year, and about 0% of that is based upon outcomes. It's all based upon enrollment, just having kids come to your school. And if we can start to shift some of that to outcomes, to having young people not just go but graduate and walk across the stage with that diploma, which changes their life forever, if we can start to incentivize places that are doing a great job of increasing graduation rates with Pell Grant recipients and first generation college goers, um, then we can step into this and help to transform young people's lives. So I think those critiques are um, not unfair and we all have to look in the mirror and see, again, not how we point fingers, but how we come together to make sure more young people have a chance to get through. And this is where your work has been fantastic, that the value of a college degree has never been higher. So again, the stakes here are huge. Um, but when you don't have a college degree or when you go and don't graduate and accumulate that debt, that's like the worst possible scenario. So how we incentivize more places to build cultures not around access, but around completion. And again, some places are doing amazing work and breaking through. Um, other places, frankly, aren't. And the fact that we fund them all the same, um, I, we're, we're not helping here. Can you change that without legislation? Because I assume you're not getting legislation on that. Um, to start to move money would take legislation. But again, all of our stuff is never, has our work been Republican or Democrat? It's been you know, straight down the middle, what's right for kids, and no one can accuse us on anything of playing sides. But this is taxpayer money. This is your money and my money, and this is you know very important Republican principle of let's not waste taxpayer money, and let's invest in what's working. And so there should be Republican support there. And I think Democrats trying to expand access and you know care about the poor and want to make sure places are actually helping them have a chance and giving them that that opportunity. Um, this one, common sense would say politics should not be a part of it. Washington is very dysfunctional right now, so common sense has not been prevailing. Um, but to be clear, it would take legislation to start to move money. What the president has challenged us is to come out with a rating system, to start to have some metrics to put out there. And I'm, I'm a big believer in transparency. And we have 7,000 institutions of higher education, two-year, four-year, public, private, nonprofit, for-profit, faith-based. Young people don't have great information to make the right choice. If we can help young people vote with their feet and vote with their dollars, um, I think that will help to move this in the right direction. Let's get to the ratings in a minute, but since you mentioned the president, I want to ask about him. You've obviously known him a long time, since before he was the president. Can, can you talk to us about how he is involved in your work, meaning um, uh, how often are you talking to him? What parts of the work does he seem most engaged in, and how does he think about education? Well, this one's, again, just been so lucky, and I honestly took the job, not because I wanted the job, I really wanted to stay in Chicago, but because I wanted to work for this president and to have your friend become president is a sort of crazy thing to have happen. And, uh, Can so you still play basketball against him as hard as you did before? Whoop him every chance I get. So, <laughs> no, 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 that's the one place where he gets to be a normal human being, so no, no mercy. Um, uh, this one is just so personal for him and Michelle, and this is, you know, everyone knows this stuff, but, you know, Michelle's family, her brother was one of my good friends growing up. 
fantastic family, but neither one of her parents went to college. And she and her brother broke through and you know, went to Princeton and she went, went on to Harvard. Changed their lives, obviously, forever. Um, President's dad was well-educated, but dad basically abandoned the family. He was raised by his mom, by his grandparents, was on welfare, and had great education opportunity. Now he's the leader of the free world. So he gets at a very personal level that this is the fork in the road, and that young people with educational opportunity can do anything they want, and those without have nothing out there for them. So at every level, everything, you know, whether it's on the early childhood side and trying to increase access, he's asked Congress for $75 billion to go from you know, 1 million kids in pre-K to 2.2 million. Um, that's a difficult ask for Congress, but he is all in um, on that. And again, we've put a billion dollars through the Department of Ed, where historically we did like nothing. So that's a huge step in the right direction, investing about 20 states now and a couple more to come. Um, on the K-12 side, all, I mean, everything we talked about, raising standards, reducing dropout rates, increasing graduation rates. He's challenged me all the time, how are we getting better faster? He goes out and talks to kids, we talk to kids together. Um, then the higher ed side, um, he worries about, you know, everywhere he goes, the most number of, he gets all these letters, you know, thousands of letters a day, maybe the biggest category he gets from letters are people struggling with college debt. So in all of these things, he is intimately engaged and whether it's yesterday, literally yesterday at a cabinet meeting where he spent a lot of time talking about this stuff, whether it's you know, lunch or, you know, two weeks ago, this is one that, you know, just left a vice, talking to the vice president right now about some of this stuff. This is one where, um, for me, it's been just an absolute blessing to have so much support and, frankly, courage, um, taking on some orthodoxies uh, to, to try and do the right thing for young people. You mentioned college debt. Um, I wrote a piece last week arguing that some of the concerns about college debt are exaggerated. Not that it's not a problem, but yeah. that they're sometimes exaggerated. Am I wrong about that? No, and again, I don't, I'm not just saying this to, so you'll take it easy on me. I just think you've been such a voice of thoughtfulness and, and reason, and your, your clarity of thought on this has been fantastic. So college debt is generally too high, and we should do everything we can to reduce it, and we've done what we can to reduce the cost of debt and reduce you know, loan repayments at the back end. But like anything else, I think there is good debt and bad debt. And if you have reasonable debt and you are getting your college degree, I think you and others have said that, you know, have demonstrated in a pretty profound way that over the next 40 or 50 years of your life, this is the best investment, bar none, by far, that you can make. But where you have inordinate debt and no degree, <laughs> um, you're in worse situation than when you started. And so, again, in all these things, there's a common sense, you know, middle. If we can reduce the cost of college, if we can reduce debt, but increase graduation rates, which is really what this is about, um, then I would feel much better. And we're starting to see some movement in the right direction. I talked about high school graduation rates up in the black and Latino community. That's translated to pretty significant increases in college enrollment in the minority community, which is huge. We have to make sure that enrollment translates to completion. Is, for someone who actually graduates and gets a degree from a, a let's say, a good state university, um, uh, are you comfortable with that person having $30,000 in debt, which is the current average? It's, in a, in a perfect world, it would be less than that, but on the t you know, in terms of my top 10 list of words that keep me up at night, that's not out there. So that, it, is, it is too high, but I think something like that is manageable, again, with a degree where you can go get a job. Um, I would like to reduce it. We're doing everything we can to reduce it. We're doing public service loan forgiveness to bring people into teaching and other things, making sure folks can follow their heart. Um, but that's not the end of the world. Where you have sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in debt and no degree, that is the end of the world. Right. That is catastrophic. Or even twenty thousand yeah. dollars in debt and no degree. Right. That's pretty bad. Right. Why do you think you've obviously butted heads with both Democrats and Republicans in different ways? Why do you think there is so much skepticism right now on the left? about the value of education. And, and, and I mean, there are, you have liberal think tanks in Washington saying education's overrated, education doesn't solve our problems. And obviously, if you, you, know, if you make the, the counter argument strong enough, you can knock it down, right? Yeah. But it seems to me there's a huge amount of skepticism on the left about the value of an education. And why do you think it's there? And is there anything to it? I would guess you mostly disagree with it. But is there anything underlying it that you think is important to keep in mind? Yeah, and again, these are broad brush strokes, so I think that's a little bit of a broad characterization. And so much of the supports, for example, for more investment in early childhood education is coming from the left. Yep. We, we, we need that. We need more from our friends on the right. Um, 
So I actually worry, it's funny, I don't worry about that one at all, so I don't lose any sleep in that. I am convinced in my heart, my bones, and my head that this is the best investment in young people, in stronger families, in keeping high wage, high skill jobs in our, in our country, in our country economy. I'm convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt this is the best investment we can make. My worry on the left is much less, I don't, really don't worry about that at all, is again just making sure that we are building accountability into everything we're doing at every level, early childhood, K to 12, higher ed, that is not just about more resources. I'm the biggest proponent for more resources, but we have to show results. We have to show that we are making a difference in young people's lives. So that's the, again, these are broad brush strokes, yep. but that's, that's a challenge on the left. So I was sitting on the stage yesterday, Larry Summers was sitting in this chair, and, and you know Larry Summers, obviously, he has a way with words, and he, he for, for those of you who weren't there, he compared, he compared our current education system to communism, and that's not even too much, that's not an exaggeration. He said, look, one of the great things about capitalism is that the consumers have the power and the producers are trying to appeal to them. The way communism works is the producers have the power and the consumers are trying to make sure they get a little bit of meat at the end of the week from their butcher. Education, we have it flipped. And we need to, to change that. Um, is that fair? Um, far be it for me to, to argue with Larry Summers, so <laughs> <laughs> be careful what I say here. Well, it's actually interesting. So let's take the higher ed example, which is the absolute counterexample. Go back to where I started. We have 7,000 institutions of higher education. We have a huge market, but the marketplace is broken. So I don't know how that compares to communism versus democracy or, or whatever, free markets. But we have a free market but we have a very inefficient system and a lack of ability for young people and their families to make good choices. So that's a very different and interesting challenge. One of the many things I learned, we've done a lot to simplify the financial aid form, the FAFSA form, and get more people filling out. We've had a lot of breakthrough, but I was stunned that like 75% of kids who fill out the financial aid form, the FAFSA, they apply to one school. Right. So we have this, you know, they could look at 6,999, but for financial reasons and location reasons and a bunch of, they're, appears to be choice, intellectually there's choice, but choice is not being exercised on the higher ed side. So that's the counterexample to what he's saying. Um, on the K to 12 side, I think you've seen many places, not other places, where there's starting to be increased choice. And whether it's traditional public schools, whether it's high performing charters, whether it's magnet schools, where there are more options. Now, we're fighting for more high quality options and we're not anywhere near we, where, where we need to be. Again, particularly in low income families and low income communities, given more great choices, that's at the heart of so much of our work of replicating high-performing traditional schools and high-performing charters. Um, so I'm a, I am a big believer in choice and competition. I think we need to have more high-quality choices on the K-12 to side. We need more high-quality options on the early childhood side, which again is desperately important. But I'd be curious what his analysis on the higher ed piece would be, because it's counterintuitive to his argument. I think it's concern about tenure, among other things. Okay. I think it's concern that colleges essentially are not geared toward um, teaching. So, so that's a different question, but again, young people have theoretically tremendous choice. How we help them, how we better inform them, how we give more transparency, how we help them to exercise that choice, theoretically could force some change in behavior. Yeah. If some universities start to lose market share because they're not doing things right, and others are gaining market share and people are voting with their feet, that's pretty powerful. But again, our marketplace on the higher education side is desperately inefficient. That's one of the things we're working on. So while we were sitting here beforehand, I, uh, I learned that you had also met uh, a young woman that I wrote about a few months ago named Sydney Nye. Um, why don't we tell them the story about Sydney Nye with you going first? So, uh, one of, again, the joys of my job is going to schools virtually every week. I've been to hundreds and hundreds of schools, and many stand out. But near the top of that list was uh, Mount Pleasant High School in Delaware, and went there with Governor Markell. Delaware was one of the first two states to win a race to the top grant from us, again, on a highly competitive process. And Governor Markell has been just a fantastic partner in this. And he basically, Delaware's a smaller state, so it's a little easier, but um, he basically made a commitment that no young person who's doing well academically would not apply to college. And I sat at a round table, I just wish, I wish to God we'd had someone taping the conversation, but we had about 15 young people from that high school and story after story that the kids told about the horrific things they had been through and what their teachers and counselors and principals had done to support them, it was stunning. Um, one young man who had been homeless, bounced place to place for years, huge anger problems, huge violence problems, been kicked out of school, and these guys sort of put their arms around him and he's going to college in the fall. Another young man, no dad, um, mother's very disabled, 
he's not sort of, he is raising his younger sister. He is her parent. Um, I said, what's that like? He said, it's very tough to raise a teenage girl. <laughs> um, he, he is 17 and she is 13. And he went on at length about, and talked about how much easier it was when she was nine and 10 and 11. I mean, just powerful, moving things. And he is raising his sister. Um, and then we had uh, the young woman who you and I have talked with and people sort of assume you tell the story um, that she's African-American, Latino. She's a white girl, right. Caucasian, but uh, very poor. Lots of, ch uh, you know, some challenges there. Extraordinarily bright. Uh, grades, I've heard of a 5.0 GPA. Somehow she had higher than a 5.0. I don't <laughs> quite know how you do that, but she had higher than a 5.0. Hugely interested in the STEM fields, but was only looking at colleges where the application was free. Um, told her counselor her dream was Stanford, but she couldn't afford the fee to fill out the application to Stanford. Those schools and counselors worked it through. She will be going to Stanford this fall, full ride, basically no expenses. And she is an extraordinary example, but for me, she just exemplifies what I saw all my life growing up in my mother's inner city tutoring program on one corner of Chicago. We have this amazing talent all over the country that gets buried because we don't give them opportunity. And we as adults present supports and opportunity. Um, young people who might not, they may not all go to Stanford, but they're going to college rather than not going to college. Or they're graduating, going to a community college rather than doing nothing. But had that school not built this culture of support, that young woman who will hopefully be very successful in Stanford and will change her families for generations to come, she would have gone to a decent school and done okay but it's a life transforming opportunity. And so the question is how we scale those kinds of things for all these gems we have, white, black, Latino, all over the nation, inner city, urban, rural, tribal communities, where we just don't, we lose that talent. And for me, that's the, the heartbreak I feel and the sense of urgency to take to scale these things that work. I agree in her case, she probably would have been okay, but I think what's so important is there so many kids who, had they, if they go to a good college, will do great. They will yeah. change their family's trajectory. But if they go to a school with a 70% dropout rate, right. there's a good chance they're going to drop they, out. They might not make it through. They may not make it through. Right. My favorite uh, thing of Sydney Nye's story is her college counselor said to her, if cost weren't an issue, where would you go? And she said, cost is an issue. And the college counselor said, I know. But I said, if cost weren't an issue. And she said, oh, Stanford. Yeah. And she's going to stand. And this is a kid who gets played by, you know, she's done everything right. You know, amazing grades, wants to, you know, solve the world's problems. But those little things that, you know, everyone in this room just takes for granted, that's like, it is an insurmountable hurdle. That's right? right. so what people have to understand. These things that seem so simple, you can't get past that. She couldn't afford to think about Stanford because she couldn't afford it. It wasn't part of her, her reality. And Sue Dinarski, who's a professor at Michigan, likes to say, when, uh, when upper middle class people react to stories like Sydney Nye and say, well, if she couldn't fill out the application, she shouldn't, she shouldn't be going to Stanford. Um, she said, upper middle class parents fill out their kids' FAFSAs, <laughs> and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. These things are incredibly difficult. Yeah, so I couldn't. That's, that's part of the problem. So I'll, yeah. I'll challenge that every single day with everything I have. Last question for me, and then we'll open it up. So obviously, this rating system that you're trying to put together is aimed at exactly what you said, which is giving people more information so they can make informed choices yeah. about colleges. Um, Richard Thaler, who's an economist at University of Chicago, um, sort of an iconoclastic uh, progressive, uh, has advised Obama in the past, has expressed concern about this system because he thinks that it's the kind of thing the government is not good at. Um, uh, whether it's because the government gets lobbied and it can't be quite truthful, whether it's because the government isn't as nimble, or maybe it's just because there's only one government and we'd rather have 30 different private places yeah. doing it and then let the best one emerge. Why are you comfortable with the idea of having the government rate colleges? And to be very clear, we're very concerned too. I say everywhere I go, we're going into this with a huge sense of humility and if we do this poorly, we could create some of those perverse incentives or disincentives that we worry about. So this is not a slam dunk, dunk, and intellectually it is difficult. And if we had 30 or 50 you know, folks on the outside starting to come up with similar rating systems or their own ideas, that would be fantastic. I'm just simply reacting to the idea, where I go back to where I started, that we put out taxpayer money, scarce taxpayer money, $150 billion a year, and none of it is based upon outcomes. 
So for me to do nothing is untenable. Now we have to be as smart and be as humble in doing this going forward, but to just have a free check, a free lunch, where you have these wildly disparate outcomes. So, so back up one more step why this is personal. So my goal in Chicago was to increase graduation rates and to increase college going rates and college completion. We started to track our kids very closely, and kids would basically, to your point, David, with identical GPAs and identical test scores going to different local Chicago area colleges. Some had like 80% graduation rates and some had like 20% graduation rates. So we started to very actively, very publicly steer kids towards certain institutions and not towards others. And so I've seen <laughs> the huge impact for good or for bad that higher ed can have, again, in terms of creating opportunity or not. So for us not to play, and again, whether it's just, you know, are you increasing your six-year graduation rate or are you not? <laughs> um, are you taking more Pell Grant recipients or are you not? What are your graduates doing post-graduation? Um, we should, you know, have a version 1.0 and a 2.0 and a 5.0 and every year try and get better at this. But to have the lack of information out there for families, and again, this is a fairly highly educated uh, group here, I spend lots of time talking to kids and families, and even for families where the parents are college educated, their difficulty at, my, at navigating all this stuff is profound. And other than getting married, it's about you know, one of the biggest decisions you make, and we make it so hard on people. So for us to not try, and again, if we make mistakes, we'll learn from it and keep going, and again, if someone else can do it better, fantastic. But for us to do nothing, for me, that's, just, that's untenable, it's untenable. I think we have some microphones moving around. Let's start in the back. And so, last quick thing I'll say is this system, which some people are reacting against, doesn't exist yet. Yes. So I keep <laughs> challenging people, give, don't tell me what you don't like. Tell me what you do like and help us do this. And we've done dozens and dozens of forums around the country and gotten great ideas. But again, we're just trying to capture those best ideas and put them together. And uh, let's not be against something that has not been born yet. I ask everyone to keep the questions succinct. Um, hi, Arnie. My name is Jessica, and I'm a former teacher, school leader, and now chief academic officer for an education technology company in New York City. And I'm very excited to talk to you because you and I were actually both featured in Steve Brill's book, Class Warfare, and I've always kind of had like an ed crush on you since then. <laughs> so um, you said that you want to know how much students are learning, how much students are growing, and that's what you care about. And I deeply commend you for that. Um, but the reality is, is that a lot of money has been invested in things like PARC and SBAC assessments, which don't necessarily do that, but instead encourage, you know, inordinate, inordinate amounts of test prep because of how, state, how high stakes they are, um, and actually don't accomplish what you want um, and what kids deserve. So what you care about in policy are diametrically opposed, and I want to know what your plan is. and. Um, I'd like to take you to coffee and give you some suggestions. <laughs> uh, so again, I want to look at you know before and after snapshots. The one point while this, you know, so these things are in their infancy, being piloted again. What are these things? Sorry, these are the these are the two consortia of states that are developing next generation of assessments. Okay. So it's about 40 states, and again, this was we try to create choice and competition. This is and, the thing you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next generation of assessments. Um, the one point that I disagree with is that saying this will create a lot more time prepping for the test. Um, I desperately hope that's not true. I don't think it'll be true. Um, this is not about filling the bubble test. This is about critical thinking skills. It's more complex uh, problem solving things that teachers, for students to learn how to do that, is not going to be filling the bubble test. But again, these will be imperfect. I think they'll be a lot better. We need to continue to improve them and having the other thing I'll say, having more states have common assessments, that's a really huge deal. Because? Because when 50 states have 50 different assessments, there's no transparency. It's opaque. And if you're a baseball team, your score for the nation is in the paper every single day. If you run a business, your stock price is in there. You don't have 50 different measuring sticks. And when states dummy down those things, they do a huge disservice to their kids. So having, over time, more states assessing kids in a common way, then there'll be lots of creativity at the local level around curriculum, around how you support teachers, around you know, teacher professional development, because we'll see who's moving the needle on student learning. Without that, you can't scale, you can't learn, you can't replicate, and you can't stop doing things that need to stop. Okay. Right here. 
Got a microphone coming. Um, thank you so much for a very provocative um, discussion. My name is Judith Libby. And I'm a retired teacher after 44 years. I've taught from the least economically advantaged to uh, AP. And uh, two things. Thank you for your service, first of all. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's the greatest joy of my life. Anyone in here who's ever taught? <laughs> One, I was delighted to hear you talk about that wonderful school you went to in Delaware. And I would like to emphasize to you who write for the New York Times, teachers should be honored. And for every poor teacher you might find, there are so many more like those in Delaware. Yeah. And if you fund teachers, we are there in the front line. And we know the answers. We're there every single day. And I'd like to see some of the funding <coughs> supporting those efforts. Um, and finally, <coughs> for assessments, I agree with that young lady. High stakes, that's why we teach to test. I didn't, but many young teachers do because their jobs are on the line. And if you continue to do that, you're going to, it's going to be counterproductive. Uh, Let me ask you, you to ask a question. Yes. Okay. okay. That's, so my question is, how else can you measure teacher performance? Yeah. Thank uh, you. Uh, it's a great question, and I should be very clear on this, that when we talk about teacher evaluation, like evaluating any other complex, critically important, difficult thing, you have to look at multiple measures. So again, folks think we only want to do test scores. We have never said that, we'll never say that. But what we have said is that a piece of teacher evaluation should be based upon, again, not students' absolute test scores, but growth and gain. And I always say if a teacher takes a child who's three grade levels behind, and they leave a grade level behind, they may still be behind, but that teacher has had a massive uh, uh, impact on that child. So um, having some form of student learning, graduation rates, dropout rates at the high school level, AP, there are lots of different things you could do. Looking at leadership roles, looking at professional development, looking at what you're doing to contribute to the school community. Uh, student surveys are really interesting. And so again, looking at multiple things, but having a piece of those multiple measures be student learning, I reject those who feel that it should be out, eliminated. And so no one's saying it should be, you know, 70% or 50% or whatever, and we've supported states that have done 50, we've supported states that have said 20% but having student achievement be a piece of, of teacher evaluation. And let me just quickly go on. This isn't just about, it's never about gotcha, it's never about firing, it's about how, again, how do we identify great talent? And I always give the example of California. California has 300,000 teachers, 300,000. The top 10%, the top 30,000, I would argue are world class. Literally some of the best teachers, not in our country, but in the, around the globe. The bottom 30,000 maybe shouldn't be teaching, should be doing something else. And no one in California can tell you who's in that top and who's in the bottom. And I just don't think that's a formula for success. So we have to elevate this, the teaching profession. We have to strengthen it. I've been very public. We should pay teachers a heck of a lot more money. We should pay teachers a heck of a lot more money to take on difficult assignments, inner city, urban, rural, remote, Native American reservations. Um, but we have to elevate the profession. And the only way we do that is to talk about excellence and to um, not be scared to have that conversation. What's the right of What's the right analogy? It seems to me the idea of saying we are going to evaluate and analyze and hold accountable is not necessarily um, different from saying we are going to respect and honor, right? And, I, I think and, they're synonymous. You cannot respect and honor if you don't value the contribution that people are making. What is the profession that you would like to see teaching resemble in terms of both respect and, and, and maybe a little bit more pay? but also in terms of accountability? Because it's not medicine. <laughs> they have the pay without the accountability. Uh, so that's a great question. I don't have a good answer. The part I was actually going to steal from medicine, um, not the, maybe not the accountability part, I love the, the, the medical residency. I love the residency model and having teachers train for a year with master and mentor teachers and not walk into the classroom unprepared to make a difference day one. And we set up far too many great young teachers for failure because they don't have the classroom management skills. So I do think, maybe you have to steal from different places yep, and do a hybrid, but I do think the residency model of, in medicine 
is one, and we have some pretty interesting pilots in some places, but if we scaled that, that would be very, uh, I think, a, a game changer. Okay. There was something back here. All the way in the back, yeah. So I got one here. Okay, great, right here. Hey, hi, Secretary Duncan. Um, I was involved in a documentary about childhood obesity in, in this country, and I'm just curious, since so many public schools have contracts with fast food restaurants, and one of the experts in the film describes schools as 7-Elevens with books these days, and there's a direct correlation between nutrition and the ability to learn. I know the First Lady is working in this department, but is, is the Department of Education, can it get more involved with the USDA in overseeing the kind of food that we're feeding our children on a daily basis? Yeah, well this is a great sort of interesting political question. So the First Lady, as you know, has spent a huge amount of time and energy. We're partnered, Tom Vilsack's a good, good friend. He gets us intimately. His wife's been a lifelong educator. So they've put in place, you know, they've moved the needle in some pretty significant ways. Um, what you're seeing now is some pushback in Congress to water that down. And so this one, again, I, I think should not be a partisan issue. I think we should all be for more healthy food for kids. We should all be against obesity. And, and again, we have young kids obese, think what that means for them the, for the rest of their lifetime and healthcare costs and everything else. But right now, while you may be dissatisfied with the progress we've made and we'd like to go further, even the progress we've made is in danger of being rolled back. I have to say, as someone who's admired Katie Kirk's interviewing skills my whole life, it's a thrill to have you <laughs> ask a question during this. <laughs> I'm serious about that. In the back. How's it going? Uh, my name's Andrew Kofsky. I'm from the University of Michigan. And I wanted to ask a question based on the fact that, as a student who goes to the University of Michigan right now, and is a student in college, moving through my high school years up through college, I did most of the work that I did for the grade. Not necessarily for that aptitude for knowledge, but for the grades in order to hit that benchmark to get to that next level. And I feel like a lot of students in high school and in college right now do it the same way that I do. And is there any way that you see that we could maybe change that or shift that culture? And if so, how? That's a great question. I think I, don't, I do not have a good answer for you. Um, what I think, I'll go a little broader. What I think we have to do as a nation, and both with young people, but frankly with their parents, I think people don't understand what's at stake. Um, going forward, and that, again, without real educational opportunity and being challenged and doing hard work and becoming lifelong learners, which is maybe the most important thing you can learn. It's not what you memorize today for the test, but all of us have to. If he's not learning every single day, he's going to be obsolete. If I'm not learning every single day, I'm going to get fired. So how we help young people and their families understand the international competitiveness of our economy now and what children in other nations are doing. And having those honest, tough conversations. Um, I don't have an easy way of doing that. One of the things that Amanda Ripley is a, you know, someone I have a lot of respect for, she and I have done some work talking to young people from other countries who come to school in the United States, and she's looked at people from the United States who've gone to school in other countries. We did a panel of students, and it was like a devastating indictment. Every single student who came from other countries, who was going, who, they were going to some really good schools in the United States, every single child said their schools back home were more challenging than their schools here. And when we raise the bar, we get lots of pushback that things are too hard. And I think we have to start to embrace the difficulty, the complexity, encourage people to find their passion, find what they love to do, um, you know, learn for learning's sake, but also understand what's at stake if we're not getting better in all of these areas. Her book is called The Best Students in the World, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So smartest kids, smartest kids in the world. world. Yeah. Thank you. How they got there. Thank um, you. Uh, so let me end with this, which is ask you to give yourself an evaluation. You, you came in more than five years ago yeah, now with yeah. some really clear ideas about what to do. How, what would you judge has worked? What would you judge has not? And, yeah. and how, do the rest, how can the rest of us judge, not you personally so much, yeah. but whether this larger movement that you are very much a part of is actually making a difference, or whether it's yet one more attempt to fix something that is going to leave us saying a decade from now education's yeah. in crisis. So I think about that every single day, let's maybe just take it in pieces very quickly. So on the early childhood side, thrilled that we've made unprecedented investments to increase both quality and access. But whether you want to grade me or the nation, um, the fact is the United States ranks about 28th in developed countries in providing access to high quality early learning opportunities. I don't think any of us should be proud or feel good about that fact. And again, given levels of poverty, given the fact that our nation's public schools this fall 
for the first time ever will be majority minority. If we don't do a better job in our underserved communities, the consequences for our nation are huge. So proud of the progress there, but we are, let me really, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Um, on the K-12 side, again, thrilled high school graduation rates are at all-time highs. Feel fantastic about that. Feel fantastic that we've cut dropout rates in half. But as I said earlier, almost a million kids leaving our schools and many of our graduates not really being prepared, at best incomplete, you know, have a long way to go. And then your point on the higher ed side, um, access, we have more folks going, but the United States ranks 12th internationally in college completion rates. One generation ago, we were first. And again, that's not something we can be proud of. So at every level, we should be dissatisfied. We should have a huge sense of urgency. What troubles me is all the pressure I get is to go slower. And I think we're not going nearly fast enough at any level. And so how we get better faster, how we take the politics and ideology out of this, we're fighting for kids, for strong families, for communities, for the nation. Um, we as a nation have to have a much greater sense of national mission behind this than we do. Um, last thing, I would, what I would love to see, where I didn't give us not a great grade, is I would love to see education actually become a voting issue. And again, Repo Democrat, Republican, I could care less. Every politician is pro-kid, pro-education. Yeah. The vast majority do nothing, it is lip service. And it's not, I don't blame them, I blame us as voters. And until we hold folks along the political spectrum accountable for increasing investment and increasing accountability, um, our nation will struggle. And so for me, that would be the greatest win would just to see people across the, uh, across the political spectrum voting for people who will walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And we're not close to that either. Thank you for the good questions, everybody.